Um, and I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. I know the hour's late, and we are standing between you and a reception, so very much appreciate your <laughs> undivided attention. But I do think this is a nice capstone to the discussions we've just been having. Um, I loved the quote, um, you know, we don't need aspiration, we need progress. And what we're going to discuss today is real progress on a public-private partnership. The, we've seen successes, it's early days, but it really is boots on the ground. How do we think about ways not only to talk about collaboration, which we all know is needed, it's been a very recurring theme, but how do we actually turn that into leveraging data? How do we give, how do we um, think about leveraging the skill sets of different public and private entities to really come together to make progress, to provide a framework and to provide ability for people to think about not only implementation, but how to do successful implementation. So it's not just throwing money out there, but how do we think about targeted implementation for resiliency, for future funding, for thinking about being strategic when it comes to maximizing climate benefits. So I think it's a nice capstone, um, and then we can all go have a drink. So thank you for sticking around. Um, but um, so I'm here with Jessica, and um, she's going to discuss um, a recent success um, that they've had. They've had um, at and in a partnership with FEMA and Argonne Labs from DOE. Um, and she's here to discuss a new tool that they've put together. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about your work at at and and how this sort of came about? Sure. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for staying. <laughs> it's such an honor to be here. So I'm the director of environmental sustainability at at and I'm part of a larger team that addresses both the traditional areas of climate change mitigation and the adaptation side. But my team's work focuses on how can we prepare both our company and the communities that we serve for the risks related to climate change. So what that actually looks like day to day is we're having meetings with network engineers and folks in supply chain saying, hey, we've looked at the latitude and longitude of this particular central office in Texas where we see a lot of mobility traffic and we're actually seeing some flood risk in the future. So what can we do about that? So it's very exciting work and very gratifying work, of course. Um, when I stepped into this role, AT&T was already receiving a lot of recognition for the work that we were doing in the resilience space. So I wanted to very quickly figure out what were we doing that was so different and so unique and what about our approach was so successful. So I can break it down into three things. One is forward-looking leadership. Two is the appetite for collaboration with external experts, which gets to our topic today. And the third is an ethos at AT&T, which is really centered on data-driven decision-making. So let me dive quickly into each of those. Um, on the forward-looking leadership front, so the director or the, the gentleman who oversees our group who told me I can't give him credit for this, but he's here, right there. Um, <laughs> years ago, he saw the need for forward-looking data. We needed to be thinking about climate resilience. AT&T has a vast footprint. We are a sprawling enterprise, and we have cell towers and central offices and buildings that are largely outside. And we need to be thinking about how to harden and strategically fortify our operations. However, the data that we needed at the time, which was granular forward-looking data did not exist. So, getting to the partnership piece, we reached out to Argonne National Laboratory, which is housed in the Department of Energy, and they produced a one-of-a-kind data set that allows us to look forward to 2050, that allows us to actually see flood risk on a neighborhood level, so literally, we're, we look at grid cells the size of two football fields to be able to really understand climate risk. Um, and it also has assumptions baked in that are on the worst case scenario, so an RCP of 8.5, which allows us to really understand, okay, what's the worst thing that can happen and how can we fortify our operations um, and make better decisions. Now, the, the last piece is about data-driven decision-making, which is very much a part of AT&T, as you can imagine. 
But what we did with this climate data is we overlaid it on a map of our, all of our critical infrastructure. So we knew that this data could not live in a spreadsheet. It needed to be on a map that people could look at and really understand the red spots. Where are we going to see risk? And to our engineers' credit, when we actually showed them, you know what? This particular cell tower is going to see up to six feet of flooding, so we might want to think about elevating a generator, or we might want to think about burying cables. They listen. And that's really important because you have to build trust in data that is forward-looking, right? It's not historical. You, don't, you didn't see it. You didn't see the flood impacts in the past. This is forward-looking. Um, so, <laughs> all to say, it's my role to continue all this great work and to continue making progress to help our company manage physical risk. So, who, um, it, and it makes sense for, uh, for AT&T to want this information. What was the motivation behind a publicly available tool to give, you know, to, to let this out in the public for people to have this information as well? Sure. So I'm so excited to get to talk about our Climate Risk and Resilience Portal, which is newly launched as of November in 2022 and is the byproduct of AT&T, FEMA, and the Argonne National Laboratory coming together to put this climate data that we have used in the hands of those who need it most. Emergency managers, city planners, chief resilience officers, those who need to be looking forward and managing long-term risk. Um, in terms of how it came about, so of course we had been using the data, we were sort of the guinea pigs for it and was able to give some of that feedback to Argonne of what struggles we've had and where it's most usable and how we've been able to leverage it in discussions. Um, FEMA simultaneously was having conversations about we need to provide even more tools for communities to be able to do even more strategic hazard mitigation planning and to be able to adapt more strategically and better use the funds that are available. So. Um, what the tool is, you can go on today, you can plug in your city, and you can look at the changes over time in precipitation, in temperature, in drought conditions. And what that allows cities to do is to identify vulnerabilities in infrastructure so that you can look at schools, you can look at municipal buildings, you can think about what challenges may we face in terms of drainage systems in this urban area. And all of that allows cities to apply for funding to be able to address resilience issues and allows us to um, better fortify the United States. So it's a really exciting project to be or a part of. Or as an of. individual, you can go onto this portal and realize yeah. that your home city of Sacramento, California, will go from <laughs> 93 degrees average summer temperature to 98 degrees in the summer and get a little nervous about that. So it's also it's also a fun tool just for, not for city planners, but for individuals yeah. to get that information. Like, do I need to make sure my AC is really dialed? I probably do. Um, so I think we've talked a lot about the lens of equity on this too, and um, sort of you talked about giving this to emergency responders and to cities, but um, is there a way to sort of view this through an equity lens and to help those sort of most in need of this disproportionately um, impacted individuals or regions? Absolutely. So equity is at the heart of the climate risk and resilience portal. And it, I say that for a couple of reasons. One, it's democratizing access to a data set that the private sector paid for. And AT&T from the get-go was not going to hoard this data. It's just too important. And we recognize that we cannot be resilient in a vacuum. Because if our, ultimately, our network depends on power lines working. And that depends on other things. So all to say, we have to all be working on this together. I want to give a couple of use cases about what's really special about this tool and the data layers that are in there. So not only can you look at an area, for instance, um, Sacramento, and, um, and be able to see changes in temperature, but if you look at heat maximums, you can also look at population information alongside those climate indicators. So as an example, um, thinking about heat waves, right? Um, you can actually look at what areas have populations that are over 65, what areas have populations that are below the poverty level. And that enables city officials to be able to think strategically about, hmm, where should we place cooling centers in the future? Where do we need to distribute resources so that the populations who are most vulnerable, who might not have access to air conditioning, 
We can place these things in areas where those who need them most will get them. Um, another use case is around flooding. So you can see with the tool concentrations of mobile homes. So you can see, okay, if there's going to be a, lot, a large increase in precipitation, we may need to educate and empower X community of mobile homes to say, hey, this is, you need to be prepared for this risk and to take action there. And then the last case is, of course, the interplay between heat and power. So we know that heat waves can tax the grid. Now that can cause brownouts, blackouts, et cetera. So uh, using this tool, you can actually see um, concentrations of populations of Medicare recipients who are on power dependent devices. So using those two things, you can that enables you to make better decisions and enables you to think about capacity for the future and enables you to think about, okay, how do we protect those populations who, this is a life or death situation and we need to be, you know, planning better, so. And I would add to that, I think there's been a lot of discussion about leveraging the available federal funds and yes. this can really help cities and regions target that and be like, okay, no, now we know we need to go after this level of funding to then protect, to provide resiliency for these exactly. communities. Um, so you said it launched in, the portal launched in November of 2022. Um, what are the early successes or early horror stories that you want to share? Like, you know, <laughs> what are lessons learned? I mean, th I think this is a good example yeah. of a collaboration, but like, yeah, what are the cautionary tales or what are the successes that you've seen happen? Yeah, so I'll divide that into quantitative and qualitative successes and areas to grow. Um, so on the quantitative side, what was so exciting to us to see, we just launched this and we've already seen 22,000 downloads of reports um, of people looking, doing exactly what you did, where they plug in their city and they look to see the changes over time. So just that you know, organic traffic was really heartening to us because we actually haven't put any marketing dollars behind this and already we're seeing traction. On the qualitative side, I've participated in several focus groups with chief resilience officers, with those who are building hazard mitigation plans, um, with emergency planners and responders, and we've been able to ask, is this data helpful to you? Will this help drive decision making in the future? Will this help you get more money? And we have gotten universally a response that it is, with also the caveat that, ah, it could also use these additional things. So we've gotten some great feedback on how the user interface could be a little bit more friendly. The whole idea behind this is that cities don't need to hire an expensive consultant to do resilience planning. You can go on and click on there, and I did this with my mom, so we, you know, I was able to test, test this out among my favorite technology user. And, you know, and again, we were able to see it really is accessible, but there are areas where we can make it even more so. So those were some of the early wins and um, opportunities we have. Opportunities for growth, I like yeah. that. It's a good, a good angle. Um, so you've heard a lot about um, sort of like how do people use this? Like what's the case study? So people in the audience who either you know work for different corporations, how can they sort of incorporate this information, or how would you view them incorporating this into sort of their their portfolio planning or their future planning? Sure. So I can share even more about how AT and T does it, and I yeah. think that can <laughs> share lessons for others. So. We operationalize the data in two key ways. The first way is that we first have a list of the most critical assets. So think of the most important central offices with the most expensive <laughs> and critical equipment. And then we ran um, those latitudes and longitudes and um, put that into our GIS system as well as this data and identified, okay, we need to take steps to perhaps put a generator here. We need to take steps to put a floodgate on a door in this office in Baton Rouge. And we need to think about burying these aerial lines. So all of this data is informing both how we harden the assets that are in the ground today, but also it informs how we think about building out our network in the future. So for those of you who are retail organizations, if you wanna think about the placement of a storefront, or if you wanna think about um, land use cases, right? You know, what is, Should we make this commercial a commercial property? Should we not? 
Those are the kinds of things that as you're looking towards the future, you can think strategically and have the future in mind and not just be using past data that may not tell you about the risks that are to come. So those are two key ways that we have used it and I've heard that it's helpful for others. Well, I think one interesting thing, um, it's not just for a city to look at sort of the trajectory of their city, but for bigger regional planners to look at the um, unequal impacts of climate yes. change across a region Absolutely. and to be able to pinpoint where there should be spending. Because it is, you can look at the current impacts and then future impacts and really um, see that not everyone is going to be impacted in the same manner. Depends a lot on socio-demographic and yeah. where you start from. Um, but we've talked a lot about, um, like, what are, you, what are you optimistic about? Or what, like, how do you see this growing, or this type of public-private partnership? Do you see a role for this, not just in this use case, but like, what are the successes, and like, what are you optimistic about in this sort of space of collaboration? Yeah, well, I mean, we've learned so much from our partners at FEMA and Argonne, and I, I'm gonna use a cheesy metaphor, so for those of you who were children in the 90s and watched Captain Planet, um, I like to see us all as bringing each our own um, critical and, and valued skill set to the table as we're all tackling this problem of building um, the U.S. resilience. So um, for AT&T, what excites me is that we're bringing our experience using the climate data. We really understand how, you know, initially people can be skeptical of it, but then over time you can really win out by showing how thoughtful, how granular it gets and how actionable it is, right? Um, we have, of course, Argon, who produced this one-of-a-kind data set, has these you know, specialized supercomputers that are producing this data that allow us um, internally and soon to be shared on the, uh, the Climber portal, um, wildfire data, looking at drought data, looking at wind, et cetera, flood data. So, um, so they bring their special gifts. And then FEMA, the premier disaster preparedness and response organization, which really helps us stay true to what are the pain points points that we're seeing in municipalities across the country and how can we better equip those communities for the risks of the future. So uh, what are the next steps for the partnership? Is it is it a one-off? Is it, I mean, you said there's intent to, like, yeah. will, it, will the portal continue to be updated, expanded? What's the goal for AT&T? Yeah, so a couple things. Um, one, we are expanding, as I just mentioned, um, the data sets that are available in the portal. So today there's precipitation um, and there's drought indicators and temperature. In the future, we'll have wildfire risk, which has been really fascinating. And I'm sure for those of you who are on the West Coast permanently, um, you want to be looking at that data. Um, and then uh, it'll have drought, uh, flooding. And the flooding data is really fascinating because it's polluvial flooding, so you'll be able to look at creeks and better understand. You know, it's intuitive that on the coastlines, of course, we're going to see flooding, but in inland areas, it's not as intuitive. And so it allows you to be really strategic about, okay, you know, my office here is at risk, but not here. So, um, so very excited about the incremental data sets. We're also going to be providing technical assistance to communities. So we're going to be doing sort of tutoring sessions, if you will, um, with uh, FEMA regions to be able to train um, managers how to use this data, how to integrate it into your hazard mitigation plans so that these risks are covered um, you know, when these events do happen. So I'm really excited about the education piece and building awareness and getting engagement and getting feedback um, because we want those success stories. We want to see how this is helping communities. No, that's awesome. Well, I think we've got um, a few minutes left. If anyone has any questions, oh, we've got a few. We've got a lot. Okay. <laughs> See, everyone stayed awake. Thank you. Questions. Thank you. <laughs> so I have a, a, a question and a request leading back to Monique. If you could increase sales of Dr. Pepper, Diet Dr. Pepper, to Philadelphia, my wife and I would be eternally grateful. So. <laughs> If you could get on that, that would be really good. It's the end of the, the day, so this might not make any sense, but uh, you're, you're gathering data and people are giving it for free. Yeah. We're all aware that if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Is that something that you have to contest with as you're asking people to give information about where they live and, and things like that? So we do make sure we... 
this, this website is um, hosted by Argonne National Laboratory. So they have all sorts of rules around collecting personal information. Any data that I see, I can see the number of, for instance, like unique users. I don't know where they are. I don't know who they are. So all of that is you know, purged from what we can see. So it's truly not that way. What I would say is that, you know, for those of us, we have a, um, a tab on, on the website, give us feedback for those who would like to volunteer and be part of shaping this product. We want the users to be able to give us the information of what was helpful and what was not about the tool, but there is no collection of information to better hone, oh, in Washington State, we're seeing you know, a huge uptick, and so we should really dive in there, and we don't have that kind of data, so. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Karen Glitman with the Center for Sustainable Energy. Thank you. I'm really excited about this data. I have a couple of questions. I can already see some use cases. Uh, we do a lot of uh, optimal location of EV infrastructure, so layering that into that database and that analysis. But I'm wondering the level of granularity that you bring this data down to. That's one question. The second, you talked about adding new data sources, but how often and frequently are they going to be updated in projections refreshed? So those two questions, thank you. Yeah, great question. So, um, so today, for instance, um, if you look up a central office that AT&T has, I keep bringing up this, this term, I hope you know what that means, but um, if, uh, if you look up an office, we can see the surrounding grid cells um, and neighborhood information. So for instance, um, you can see a, a 200 meter by 200 meter grid cell and our asset is within that. And we can tell for that grid cell what the risk is. So you can see that we might see uh, five feet of flooding, you can see that there's a probability of, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm sorry, of, of wildfire, you know, you can see probabilities of these things happening within that grid cell. In terms of updating the information, we hope to get even more granular and we hope um, to get it to a point where it's even more actionable, but again, we need that feedback, but Argonne is continuing to hone it. Um, the other thing that they're adding is um, they're introducing new scenarios. So um, 4.5 um, uh, or an RCP of 4.5 will be a new scenario that will be, or a new assumption that will be embedding in the tool. So you'll be able to, to see that as well. So we're looking to further enrich the tool, but it does allow you to get pretty granular, especially with the flood data. And I, I will say, just um, so I used to work for the Climate Impact Lab with Rhodium Group, um, who also was working on the social cost of carbon. And so we've seen this influx of data, but it's sort of like there's a desire for more granularity, but you have to wait for the data to, like, for the research and the data to sort of catch up. So it's sort of a chicken and the egg problem. Everyone wants to know exactly where we are, but we've made huge strides. I mean, the social cost of carbon, the EPA um, refresh of that is going to be much more granular um, in terms of the data that they're collecting and then aggregating. So there is, there, there's been an influx of computing power. Like you said, there's ridiculous amounts of servers being used for this in cloud computing. But a lot of it is there's just this new influx of data that's really coming at a granular level that then will allow this information to then be categorized and provided at a more granular level. But you sort of have to wait for there to be enough data for you to be able to provide the information back. So it's, it's, it's an it's a iterative product, I think, a project uh, process for sure. Sorry, I'm way in the back. Um, I had a question about updates. Um, I go to the Western Fire Resiliency Workshops that the state holds every quarter here, and it data is a big topic there. And it sounds like all of the scientists are trying to figure out what data to use. Uh, they're increasing the pace and scale of resiliency, so it's a changing landscape where you know we're trying to thin forests. And and so I was just curious, how how do you choose what data? Um, who's screening that? How do, how do you assure the users that it's good, that it's relevant? Um, is the scientific community involved in those decisions? Thanks. Yeah. So this data set is an ensemble of a couple of different climate data sets. So it um, so it does. It, you're not having to choose in that sense of you know they. Um, they merge together um, a couple of different forecasts. 
Um, in terms of, I'm sorry, the second part of your question was about um, how... You talked a little bit about forest fire risk, and I was just curious yes. how, how you assess that when it's a moving target yeah, in California. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so for the... For the wildfire data, we're using the Canadian Fire Weather Index, and it's measuring the dryness of the air, and what you layer on top of that is your own um, uh, mapping of vegetation. So for AT&T, for instance, you know, we look at, at offices that we have, and we look at, well, you know, where do we have brush, and where do we have trees, and then we can think more strategically about you know, where to clear them. But you're right that it is an ever-evolving Things. So it, you know, we are continuing to inform that data set, but for now, this is, you know, super, super sophisticated, and we do encourage, of course, those who, you know, CalAdapt is an incredible resource. So of course, we encourage those who have dynamically downscaled, high-quality data that looks at, you know, um, uh, wildfire risk to use whatever data set makes sense for you. But not every state has that. So in this way, this is you know, allowing us to serve a broader population and give them high quality data and risk. Um, if you see then, you know, heavy rainfall that could exacerbate, exacerbate that potential flooding in that region. So does this tool kind of take into account the complexity and interconnectedness between a lot of these acute and chronic risks associated with climate change? Yes, I'm going to nerd out on you for a little bit. Um, so this data was produced um, using a methodology that does allow for all the complex co climate factors, so sea level rise and temperature change and all these things combined to interplay and, and creates this forecast. So most climate data sets are produced statistically, so what that generally means is looking at how bad it is today, and then sort of averaging that forward. So this data set does allow for the complexity and the interplay of all these different factors and allows you to make better decisions because of that. Mm -hmm.